its Shonen Jump debut in 1996, Kazuki Takahashi's manga went on to inspire the long-running card, card game and multiple anime series. Uh, it still continues to endure to this day, having seen so much love, love so much you. growth, and we are excited to once again be able to speak to some of the amazing voices who have brought these characters to life in the English language version. I would like to begin by introducing someone who you know as Ranginku Matsumoto in Bleach, Shizune in Naruto Shippuden, Nurse Joy and Morpeko in Pokemon, and of course, my Valentine in Yu-Gi-Oh! Please welcome Megan Hollingshead to the stage! Hi. It's you! <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. Look at all of you. Yay! Woo! No, we're, we're happy to have you as well. Looking forward to a great conversation. In a rock. And we are next going to be bringing to our stage someone who you know as the narrator in One Piece, Gory Gabrieve in Slayers, Brock and James in Pokemon, and of course, Seto Kaiba in Yu-Gi-Oh! Please welcome Eric Stort to the stage. Make sure you get his good side. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Eric, a uh, pleasure to have you back as always. Always thank great to, to be able to have these conversations with you, as well as our third and final guest for today's panel. You know them as Mewtwo in Pokemon Mewtwo Returns, Knuckles the Echidna in Sonic X and Sonic the Hedgehog, and of course, Yugi Moto in Yu-Gi-Oh! Please welcome to the stage, Dan Green! Yeah! Thanks, guys. That was great. Good night. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and we're done. Killed my <laughs> That's the panel, everyone. Thanks. I uh, hope you enjoyed the free swag, courtesy of Disney Pixar's Elemental, only in theaters June 16th. Anyway, no, in, in all seriousness, though, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in all seriousness, though, it is fantastic to get to speak to you all again. Uh, last few times we got to speak was, was through a computer screen. So it is lovely. That is true. That is true. Yes. Lovely to finally get to, to catch up IRL. Um, so we're going to start that with... That means in real life. I wouldn't know that. I'm too old. Yes. <laughs> What's a computer screen? Okay. <laughs> so it's this box that projects oh, images, okay. right? Yeah, now I get it. <laughs> um, so we're, we're going to start with some uh, more general stuff, uh, work our way in, because uh, I definitely want to try and leave some extra time for these wonderful Yu-Gi-Oh! fans to, to ask all the questions that they would love to ask. Uh, something that we spoke about in previous panels uh, virtually uh, were you know, the, the, the TV series uh, as well as the film. So I'd like to revisit this as one of our first questions, because obviously working on a TV series, especially when you were working on the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series, uh, was a very different experience from working on uh, the, the films for, for these properties. So if you'd be so kind, uh, and we'll, we'll just go down the way from, from my right. <laughs> uh, let us know what the difference in the experience was between recording the series for Yu-Gi-Oh! And, and the films. Well, um, I'm the wrong person to start with, but I'll start talking anyway, because uh, I didn't do the films. It hasn't um, stopped you before, I mean. But I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, um, but I did do the Pokemon films, so I can tell you a little bit about that. Which I was even going to say, if we have uh, some adjacent uh, projects, if you'd like to use as basis of comparison, that's perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, dubbing is awesome, and dubbing for uh, anime is just a total gift. Um, there is just, I, I can talk about the Pokemon, the first movie, there was just such an added element of excitement. We got to go to um, a quote-unquote real sound stage that was huge and it was where they did sounds for, um, well, other movies that made it into theaters and it, was, it made me feel like a really tiny person. I felt really scared and humble um, until I started working and remembered that I do know how to do what I do. Um, and then, of course, got the experience of going to a movie theater and seeing Pokemon with other people, which, as I've told some of you when we were talking at my table, like, we record in a closet, a booth, by ourselves, and then this amazing show gets put together. It got put on TV. It was before the internet, so we knew it was popular. We knew people liked it, but unless you had friends or family members who were watching it and talking about it, 
you didn't really get much feedback, or at least I didn't. Um, so to be in a movie theater and have kids and adults and people just being excited, like to feel that energy was just so exciting and so much fun. So um, as much as I love the TV show, doing the movie was an extra, an extra high, I'd say. Yeah, that was actually, uh, I mean, all of that is exactly how I feel about so much of that. I also directed Yu-Gi-Oh! So um, getting a chance to see your work on a bigger screen like that, both as an actor and as a director, was very, very satisfying. Um, but I will say the, the most satisfying project for me in terms of the movie compared to the show was when we finally got a chance to come back and work on Dark Side of Dimensions. Um, for a long time, I really wanted to see how that show could play or how the stories could play by approaching the story in a more cinematic way closer to the original. And I'm not saying um, it needed to be just like it, but there's a, there's a way that the story can breathe. Um, when we were doing the shows for Saturday morning cartoons, it's always louder, more, bigger. And that sometimes becomes Johnny One Note. It makes things very linear. And I thought that the way that the story really would be told properly was to let that air in between the important things. And when we finally got a chance to all come back and work on Dark Side, um, I really felt like, especially for my character, um, I really felt like it gave Kaiba less yelling and screaming and more dimension so that maybe you understood really where he was coming from as a character after all those years. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it, I mean, yes, the Pokemon movie was amazing because we got to do that. When Darkseid came out, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and when Darkseid came out, I saw that it was playing in limited theaters and one of them was in my area. And so I called up the movie theater because obviously if you want to do promotion on something, sometimes you got to do it yourself. And I called up the movie theater and I said, um, hey, I'm Seto Kaiba. I live like 15 minutes from you and I'd like to invite all of my local friends to come watch this movie with me that I star in. Yeah, that's right, I star in. And they're like, okay. And so I put it on social media and I got to watch, I went to the movies with, with my fandom and we all got to watch the movie together. Um, and that was awesome because you don't know what registers or, uh, or resonates with people unless you're with them, right? And I really was part of the audience. It wasn't, uh, you know, I joke around a lot, you know, being Kaiba, I, you know, the, the ego is not really that much acting for me, but in this situation, it was truly humbling to be sitting around such amazing fans and we were all experiencing it together. So that was, that was magic. So the first time I got to do a role for a movie was actually Ente in the third Pokemon movie, Mystery of the Unknown. That's right, yeah, yeah. And, and I relate completely to what Megan was just saying, recording in the same kind of facility where you have this huge pro projection screen and even in the, uh, the hallway to wherever it is that you're gonna record, they have posters of like, Gone with the Wind and all this other stuff. You're like, oh my God. And um, w one, one moment that I will never forget so, I'm, I mean, the room was almost the size of this auditorium, and the screen was as big as that back wall. The recording booth was behind me, so I'm just looking at the screen. And so, you know, I'd, I'd do a take, uh, whatever, as uh, Hale or, or, or Ente, and, and, and because they were behind me in a booth, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm on mic, right? Uh, but after a take, I'd always, I would raise my voice, you know, to, to, so that they could hear me, even though I was on mic. So, like, you know, I'd do a line and be like, Hey guys, I can in the back. Dan, Dan, shh. We can hear you just fine. You're on a microphone. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, which is such a new move. But, um, but that was wonderful. You know, I got to go, go see it with an audience, having that experience, sharing that experience. That is part of what makes movies special. That's a part of what makes any theatrical experience special is that you're sharing it with the community of people. You will never be assembled with the same group again. You will never really have that kind of experience except for in those moments, which is what's so wonderful about being able to be here with you guys. So, yeah. Uh, you, you both mentioned, uh, Dan and Eric, uh, something very interesting that leads me into a question that I, I had for uh, all of you in general. Uh, you, you keep talking about uh, this experience, getting to share it, and especially with the, the, the films for you, you know, getting yeah, to yeah. experience it uh, with essentially you know, new, new fans, new generations of fans. So how has, 
how has Yu-Gi-Oh impacted you and how have you viewed the impact of Yu-Gi-Oh on these generations of fans and watching these, these new generations come up? And we'll, we'll start uh, from, from Dan working back. Right, so I've been answering this similar kind of question a lot uh, here at this convention. Have you guys been having a good convention? Yes, let's give it up, right? Uh, it's been so much fun to be here. And so people will, will, if I could just rephrase the question slightly, they'll ask me which was my Go for know, it. favorite character to play. And that's impossible really for an actor to answer because your job is to love every character that you portray. But the characters that I owe the most to hands down are Yami and Yugi because that's the show that introduced me to some of the, uh, the people that became the best friends of, in my life, like Eric Stewart and I. I don't know if there's a day that goes by where we don't talk. And even though Megan and I don't hang out much, I have nothing but respect for her. And we had a lovely dinner last night. Um, and, um, but, you know, and, and then there's, you know, the, the show had some success. And, and, and then to think 20 years later, we would be in a position to be meeting wonderful people like you, that was never on our radar, right? But beyond all of that, if I hadn't done Yu-Gi-Oh, I wouldn't have met the woman who became my wife. I wouldn't have the children I have today. Hard to beat. But for what it means for you, that's what I'm getting to learn. It's incredible that I'm, I'm provided the opportunity to hear such heartwarming stories. About, who here developed friends through Yu-Gi-Oh? Right. Woo! Oh, that who is beautiful. Here, who here got through a hard time by watching that show? There you go. And sometimes people give me undue credit. They say, thank you, Dan. You changed my life. You saved my life. You helped with whatever that problem was. And what's so important for me to make clear is that I was a part of something that was that thing for you. But every challenge you got through, that was you. You did that. So it's my privilege to be a part of this community. Awesome. Well said. So to, to pursue being an actor, um, this part of it is not really something you even contemplate. That's not the goal, right? That's not what's part of the job. This is a bonus. This is a humbling bonus. Um, to be someone that is affiliated with two pop culture phenomenons like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, that's, that's great. Could someone else have played those roles? Yeah. Have people played these roles too? Yeah. That's, but I was, I was lucky enough to get that opportunity. But the thing that I take away from all of this is, so the community of anime fans, the way you are supportive and the diversity and the, uh, the quirkiness. I, I mean, I'm a gamer geek. I mean, Dan will tell you, that's, that's my thing, okay? It really is. I, I, you know, I, like all of the quirky, weird, nerdy people that we are here, we're the norm. And the way we treat each other is a great template that I wish the rest of the world would follow. So these shows, bringing people together like that, um, I get to meet some of the most creative, cool, quirky people ever. And I'm lucky for that. So that's why I'm so grateful to have been part of these shows is because I get to meet you guys. So there, that's what I feel, yeah. Yeah, amen to what you both said. Um, I couldn't agree more. And um, you asked about, you know, the, I think you asked about people viewing Yu-Gi-Oh! at the beginning and now. Um, it it continues to surprise me when uh, little kids come up and they've just started watching it too. And I'm like, wow. Or uh, I had a young man come up to me and say, how long have you been doing this? You know, kind of casually. And I was like, well, I guess since the late 90s. And he was shocked. <laughs> like, that was clearly well before no he way was... you're that old. Is what he was <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like I said back in the 1800s. Um, uh -huh. But uh, yeah, it's just been a total pleasure and nothing but humbling to do have been a, a small part of so many people's lives. 
Awesome. Uh, this this actually uh, provides me. Uh, yeah. No round of applause. I, I heard that scattered. Let's let's go. Come on. <laughs> Uh, this leads me to a question that I actually asked in our uh, previous panel uh, for Jujutsu Kaisen. I think this is uh, definitely something that we can embellish on based on some of the answers all three of you have given. Uh, there is always a moment in any project, whether it is a moment when you are recording the project, when the, the project is released, or even somewhere down the line after the project has been out in the wild, that it just clicks that there is something very special about this project. What was that for you? And it doesn't have to be a specific singular instance. If it's multiple, that is perfectly acceptable as well. So uh, yeah, let's start with you, Megan. Uh, with Yu-Gi-Oh, and this does not happen with most projects, it was as soon as I saw my Valentine. I mean, just a, looking at her character and the way she stood and the, the description I was given of how she was a teenager, but she was super sassy, and um, I just loved it. I loved her, I loved the idea. I was just all in. It, it, it was such an immediate connection. So, so definitely love at first sight with your character. <laughs> <laughs> love at first sight, yes. Aww. Um, so the comedic answer is the first time they, because they brought me in to direct Yu-Gi-Oh! after I've been working on Pokemon for a while, and when I saw the first episode, I said, oh, this show will be a huge success. And they said, why? I said, because this is Pokemon 90210. <laughs> oh, wow. For your younger audience, that used to be a show yeah, yeah, back yeah, in the yeah, okay. Back in a day, it was a popular serialized show on the Fox oh, Network. Yeah, Do you the, know what the Fox is? <laughs> At the 25th anniversary of this show, I mean, that joke resonated back then. But the serious answer is, the, the day that I realized that this was a different show was probably the first convention I did post working on Yu-Gi-Oh! And the stories that I was told by fans. That, uh, you know, and I... <laughs> I, I can't get into some of them because, uh, you know, I, I'm a crier, so we don't want that right now. But well, they, we might want a little bit of but they do we for the but, content. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there, there like have been some amazing stories, and you just go, oh, this is making a difference. And there are those that will tell you it's just a cartoon, man. And I'm like, oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, I've been a new kid at school who didn't have friends. These were friends, right? And then you made friends from it. So I think that that was the moment I said, this is a special show. And there really is no rocket science to this. If you have a show that has random characters, but there's something redeemable about it, every one of them in some other you know, weird, different ways, it's not like everybody needs to be the hero. They can be the anti-hero or the rival, and you connect with him. But they have to be redeemable. That's what made Pokemon successful. There was a moral and there were redeemable characters. The same thing with Yu-Gi-Oh. The message was there, it wasn't preachy, but you cared about what happened to every one of them. And that was reinforced by the stories that you tell me when you come to my table afterwards. And I do appreciate that, but that was the light bulb moment for me. For me, um, with the awareness of what it could be, and what could be special about that. First, understand that I, I grew up in, in the 70s, and, and uh, you know, as an 11-year-old as or whatever it was, Raiders of the Lost Ark comes out. That's when I get into Egyptology stuff, right? So, and I had already, by the time I started recording Yu-Gi-Oh!, I had already had written at least a couple of Indiana Jones movies, and, oh, this would be a great idea, you know, so I was, I was really deep into it. And I was also a huge fan of Star Trek The Next Generation, and you know, particularly uh, Captain Picard, Patrick Stewart. And, and, and I, um, when, when, <laughs> when doing in the first episode, the moment where I summon Exodia, um, I, I, part of Yami to me would not have been possible without Patrick Stewart. Not that I'm doing a Patrick Stewart imitation, but he was a great reference for a person who has majesty and command and and, as, and also a sense of theatricality, right? Um, and then the whole, as I just said, Egyptology stuff was, was in my system since you know, I was a kid. So when I got to say, Exodia, obliterate! I felt so cool. <laughs> I still feel cool, right? I'm but, not gonna but, lie, I got chills off of that. 
<laughs> that's how he starts every phone call with me. I pick up the phone and it, that's what I get, and I know it's Dan. Only because, as a rock musician, Eric is hard of hearing. Uh, but, just kidding. But, uh, so, what? that, that look, when you're, a, when you're an actor, you, especially for a role that you're, you're still figuring out, you look for those things to land on, those, those gravity wells that suck you in, those hooks that you can latch onto to help pull you through. And uh, so that was definitely a, a seminal moment of me understanding where the show could go for me as a performer. Now, as you know, how that turned out for the audience and the reaction to that. I was born and raised uh, in Indiana. How many Midwesterners do we have out here? Right? So we all know in the Midwest, you keep it humble, right? You're not better than anybody else. You may have some accomplishments, but you're more likely to say, oh, well, yeah, you know, but yeah, you know, yeah, you know. And so, you know, I still feel that way mostly, but. I, it's almost like I was resisting the idea that, <laughs> that Yu-Gi-Oh! Was, was catching on the way that it did. And I think it was when I was invited to make an appearance, it was the first appearance I ever made in, in New Zealand and then Australia back in 2000, early 2000. Um, and then I was like, wow, <laughs> there are a lot of people who like this thing. <laughs> so, and that was an educational experience for me. But as a good Midwesterner, I didn't take it personally. <laughs> but it was really, really impressive, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so th there were points uh, in, in both of these last answers uh, that, that definitely worked for what I wanted to ask all three of you sure. next. Uh, so we were talking about the, the characteristics and the depth of these characters, what makes them so unique, so special, uh, it, not, not just uh, for fans to appreciate, but for the, the actors themselves to bring to life. So I wanted to ask, are there qualities of your characters that you personally feel would be worthy of praise or emulation for the purposes of being a good role model? Alternately, are there ones worthy of admonishment that you would personally use to serve as more of a cautionary tale? Anyone can take this one first. You go first, yeah. <laughs> wow, right, wow, just right. popcorn it right over. <laughs> I know. Um, so the complicated Seto Kaiba, um, I definitely related to a lot of what was going on with that character. Uh, one of the reasons I even uh, played that role is because uh, the producer knew what he was looking for, and it wasn't necessarily the voice, it was the, the character, right? Kaiba is not a villain, Kaiba is a rival, right? The Pharaoh needs a rival to push him, right? That's what it's about. That's one of the dynamics. When we go back to the Egyptian story arc, we learn that Kaiba is truly his sparring partner. I am, I am his, his, his right-hand man. I am not his enemy. But how do you portray that in modern-day high school? Um, but the other side of it is, he also puts up this bravado because he is actually quite vulnerable. He is uh, family first, right? Mokuba is his priority. Uh, if you go back and read the uh, season zero and, and know what the history is of, of what Kaiba does to protect his brother, it's pretty hardcore. Um, but I definitely could relate to that false presentation to protect the un soft underbelly as a person. Um, I used comedy um, as a kid myself to, uh, to make my friends, right? Uh, if I could make them laugh, maybe they wouldn't beat me up. And then if they did try to beat me up, I was such an angry young man, I probably would have beaten them up too. So I learned a lot playing that character, and it was easy. The sarcasm, I know, it's, a, it's a, going to be a surprise to you guys. That was a piece of cake. I could ad-lib an entire Yu-Gi-Oh! script if I had to because I understood what he was about. So the lesson is, you know, he needed to feel that he was safe and he could trust in order to be his real self. And Yu-Gi is his friend. He's not his enemy. So... If you take anything from Kaiba's, you know, bad behavior, realize that he is truly a good person. He's just, he doesn't know how to uh, not say the quiet parts out loud. He's very, he, he, he uses that as his, as his shield. So. Well, now, Eric, uh, just building on what you were saying, one of your dearest friends is Chris Collet. Yes. 
And didn't you start that relationship by beating him up as a schoolboy? Yeah, uh, two of my closest friends. <laughs> yes, Chris Collet, who you might know from, if you're a horror fan, uh, Sleepaway Camp, if you remember that movie way back in the day. He's the boyfriend who gets his head cut off. Spoiler, sorry. <gasps> but he was also in the Manhattan Project, the kid that builds his own bomb with John Lithgow and, and, and uh, Terry Garr, I think is in that. Uh, but anyway, uh, um, uh, and Firstborn, he was in that. But anyway, a big star of the 80s. My best friend, we met when we were six years old, and I said to him, you know I could beat you up. That was, I think, my intro. And he was like, no, you can't. So I did. <laughs> and and then, yet Chris found something redeemable. And then we were best friends. Yes. There you go. Yeah, to this yeah. day, yeah. <laughs> Megan, who did you beat up? <laughs> who didn't I beat up? Oh, that's yeah, a better answer. There you go. Uh, I mean, my Valentine was... If you if you really look at it, she's a woman in a man's world, um, and there's a there's often a lot of bravado, brashness, anger um, that can come out of playing that role. And I, I don't mean me playing the voice role, but a woman pushing her way into a world that uh, is not traditionally open to women. Um, and it's not like that was a storyline in Yu-Gi-Oh, but it was what was there. Um, and so I was very proud to play that role because it is, as far as we've come in this world, it's remarkable that there's still so much misogyny and, and Absolutely. inequality. Absolutely. Um, and so, and, and what's amazing is that She's not perfect at it. <laughs> She's kind of bad at it. I'm, I'm actually listening to you talk. I'm surprised how much that Maya and Kaiba have in common. I always thought so. I actually thought, you know, they, we don't do all the shipping with like who should be with what. what I always thought that their dynamic was so similar. Yeah. Like the, the fact that it's like, oh, it's Maya and Joe. It's like, no, it, it's Maya and Kaiba. They could have ruled the world. Like, yeah. And I love the way you play. I mean, not to interrupt what you're saying, but I love the way you played it because you also added that the flirtation is there but the strength is there. It's not this fluffy character. She's so tough, um, but she's also feminine, which is okay to be both. Right. And I love that. Right. Yes. And wait, wait, wait. Then... That's what shipping means? Uh, really? <laughs> Amazon loves me. <laughs> you can ship your pants. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the character that is sticking with Yu-Gi-Oh, Yugi... -Oh, Yugi it's that classic thing of your greatest strength is your greatest weakness, his open heart. So his vulnerability, right, has, uh, has him at uh, a disadvantage earlier on. But that's what sees him through. And that's what the Pharaoh responds to. And he's dealing with so much aggression and anger and confusion and, and, and all of that sort of thing. And I love how those characters, you know, they have an arc and they even each other out and, they, and you really see the journey and that's great. In terms of aspirational elements, Yugi's open heart and vulnerability, but also, I mean, who, who wouldn't like to be as assertive and commanding as the Pharaoh from time to time? I know I would, I don't really ever feel that way, but it's fun to pretend like, it, you know, that can happen. Um, so, yeah, in terms of cautionary examples from those characters, not so much in the show, but in the manga, yeah. <laughs> Whoa, yummy, dude. Um, pretty severe. Pretty severe. So. You gotta read the manga. It, it's good. Yeah, it, uh, whew, it, it I haven't dark. read all of the manga. <laughs> to be fair, I ha I'm not a manga expert, but yeah. Yeah, no, it is, uh, oh, it is some brutal stuff. Like, it, they, they pulled a lot of punches uh, in the seasons <laughs> that were brought over to America, shall we say. <laughs> and those were decisions not made uh, by anybody but standards and practices, which is, has something to do with. Uh, we we were we had to do those things so that those would air on American television at that time. So yeah, uh, so so complete. This was total. This is totally off script, uh, but it just it got me to a thought exercise. So uh, as you pointed out, very different time when we yeah. were we were first getting the original season of Yu-Gi-Oh. You now look at how far anime has come uh, as a medium uh, and being able to essentially present these shows within reasonable limits, uncensored on things like Adult Swim over on Cartoon Network. One of my kids loves Demon Slayer. No way that would have been on network television. Oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a great show, but yeah. 
I'm yeah. sorry, I interrupted. No, no, no. It, that, that's a valid point because there is there is so much beauty in there, but that show can get really rough. There is no way they're going to air that uncut on a Saturday morning in you know 2003, 2004. <laughs> no, they wouldn't let Pegasus drink wine. It was juice, you know. And, no. and I will tell you from because I was on the production side, so both networks where we had the WB and, and the Fox Box. So each network has a person, the BSMP, Broadcast Standards and Practices person, that had to review every script, every episode, and say yes, no. And it was ba there was no real set of rules. It was someone's interpretation that worked for that company. So where the WB might have said yes to something, Fox would so say no, and vice versa. So all of those decisions were made by one or two people at each network. And some of them made sense, because there are, between the hours of 6 and 12, Saturday morning cartoons in the United States have Set a certain set of rules in terms of violence. Um, of course, if you grew up watching Bugs Bunny with anvils falling on your head, like Roadrunner and stuff like that, whatever, um, you know, no one's going to grab an anvil, right? Uh, but you know, smoking a cigarette in one piece, we need a lollipop. Um, but I do think, and I didn't want to interrupt your question, but I do want to say, I do want to say that I believe that shows like Pokemon being edited down and becoming very family friendly on a network on Saturday mornings took the anime section from the back of Blockbuster on one shelf and made it worldwide made it a huge worldwide thing your grandma knows what Pokemon is your 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 grandson knows what Pokemon is it became accessible which helped make these things happen not just one convention in the in the nearest 500 miles from your house but a convention every weekend wherever you may live you could find one and get to it so shows like that though we get a little bit of a bad rap for editing them down and turning them into fam family friendly accessible shows you're welcome legitimate round of applause because i i i when i was first getting into anime in the spring of 2000 I definitely know what you're talking about because my first two anime tapes that I ever rented <laughs> were from that section of Blockbuster. Right. Revolutionary Girl Utena Volume 1 uh, and the Darkstalkers anime. Spoiler, which turned out to be the actual classic. <laughs> you watched Utena? Yeah. Literally one of my first animes. So did my mm -hmm. I adapted many of those scripts. Yeah, it, uh, absolutely phenomenal classic. And it's one that, uh, just, just to go... We're staying on the topic of anime, but just talking about a different show for a quick moment. Uh, who here has heard about uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, The Witch from Mercury? Uh, anybody here? Anybody here? Okay. Uh, so, if you haven't had a chance to check it out, uh, besides being one of the best Mobile Suit Gundam shows in, in the past ten years, it has been drawing many comparisons to Revolutionary Go Utena. It, it is basically uh. Utena with Mecha, and if you ever saw Iron-Blooded Orphans, uh, it gets it gets pretty grimy, just like Iron Blooded Orphan. So it is it is kind of a, of a best of. But Utena is the one show people keep referring back to for this new Mobile Suit Gundam. So highly recommend. It. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was just going to do uh, one quick follow up. Uh, well, to, well to I, I just want to add yes. one thing to the to the anime um, and then how it's grown in our culture. So I've always loved animation since I was a kid, and anime was so fascinating because. It didn't feel like it had to have a song and be child-friendly. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it was so refreshing to have animated content that was riskier, that was meant for adults, that wasn't, you know, targeted at kids. So th there was something intriguing about that. I mean, <laughs> Speed Racer isn't all that dangerous, but it was kind of cooler than what was available at the time. Uh, I mean, without going to superhero stuff, everything was really, really kidified, you know? So, um, so that was intriguing. And I mean, come on, like Akira? Forget about it. Didn't that just recently get remastered or something? I, th uh, I think they were uh, going to be doing a, a full remake of the, uh, of, of the, the original, but I think as a series, uh, okay. I believe that's what they were going to be doing. So an, an right. updated retelling of the, the original manga. Which, right. spoiler, there's a lot that did not make it into that movie. Well, like, for sure, for sure. It it's very expansive. But, I mean, but if you, if you have the time, take the time to uh, just watch Akira, or I know some people pronounce it Akira, I don't mean to be offensive. Um, but uh, what they had to do as art... Who's here an artist? Who here draws? Okay, a couple right. of who, artists who, here. Who, nice, who nice. here wants to animate? Anybody in the animation? 
what they had to do, the work that they had to work so hard accomplishing is just mind-blowing when you consider the time that that was made. It's just extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, so, so to kind of put a pin on this so we can take a few questions before we wrap up. Uh, so part of why I wanted to talk about this, this kind of you know, change in uh, how anime is able to be uh, portrayed in essentially mainstream media these days Given the opportunity, and uh, Eric, especially as a director, I would love to, to get your take on this, not just as actor, but also as director. Uh, being able to essentially tell the unfiltered original story, because we've seen that with Sailor Moon, uh, with, with its uh, you know, recent re-release over the past few years of the original series, unfiltered, getting to revisit the original story as it was originally presented. What would, what would you enjoy most about that, uh, and would you, would you love to jump on that? Uh, so there are definitely, going back to the, the comment I made about being more cinematic with how the, the, the original stories are told, but I will push back and say there are things in the original things that I find very offensive and derogatory towards women in, in some of the anime uh, that were removed. And, and I, I, I don't do those kinds of shows. I don't dub them. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not here preaching to you, but I'm, I'm a family-friendly uh, character on many things. I don't want someone to say, I want to, hey, you know, mom, dad, can we rent this thing because Eric Stewart is my favorite in Pokemon and he's in this thing and then it's inappropriate. But I also, I'm a father of daughters. I'm raised by strong women and different cultures have different ways to do these things. And there's things that are very sexually explicit that I just, I just don't think I'd want to be involved in telling the stories that way. I don't think we need to do it that way. That's not everything in anime. But there's a huge part of the original culture that is. And I don't want to just gloss over that part of it. But there are, you know, the comedy stuff and, and some of the stuff. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in Shaman King. I'm Marco in Shaman King. There's times that I'm, you know, they pull my pants off and I'm like running around in my underpants, which is like life imitating art in my house. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there's that too. But yes, I, I would love to do things to tell the story with more air, if that makes sense. It's not the notes you play, it's the, one, it's the space in between, as Miles Davis would say. That's how I would like to approach a lot of cartoon. Yeah, that's my answer. I have something to add, but I, I feel like Megan's getting shut out a little bit. Megan, did you want to say anything? All right. Um, <laughs> one, thing that, one thing that Eric and I would really like to do is to do a voicing of Takahashi's manga. Ooh. If if you go, my, my social media on Instagram and Twitter is at Dan Green Voices. Uh, it was several months ago, but I, if you're on Twitter, I I pinned it on my thing so you can see it. We had one minute. It's where where Kaiba swipes the blue eyes white dragon. So it's just the two of us. But I'm a huge comics fan, and I've also uh, directed and, and audio produced a number of uh, motion comics for Marvel. You might have heard of Marvel. Um, this was a long time ago, but it was really fun to do. But so I have ultimate respect, I have a lot of respect for what's on the page. And so when I threw that minute of visuals together and, and, and Eric you know, provided a great performance, um, but I wanted it to feel like you were reading the manga so the images go from right to left. And our vision for it is that we would have minimal amounts of music, minimal amounts of sound effects. It's, it's really just what's on the page being voiced by the actors who you know in those roles, but we wouldn't change the names. So Joey would be portrayed by Wayne Grayson, but obviously that character is not named Joey, not in the, in the original manga. So, um, uh, so I, I think I, I kind of went even further back in regards to your question. Um, not just like the original anime intent, but like what the anime was inspired by. Yeah, like the manga. actual source material, the manga. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot to be said about that, and I think it's, well, I don't know it for a fact, it's probably true that oh, Sensei Takahashi, uh, I can't believe it's been almost a year, yeah. But uh, I doubt that he had any concept when he was sweating over those boards in his 20s that he would have contributed such an amazing thing to our worldwide culture and a community that is thriving and vibrant. Well said. Mm -hmm. Rock and roll. Uh -huh. So we do have enough time for a couple of questions. Uh, let's have you folks line up at the mic. I know that we did uh, start maybe about five or so minutes in, so we'll we'll have a little bit of a spillover since since I'll be basically living here for another panel afterwards, so I don't I don't mind. All right, uh, let's begin with our first question, and let's try to keep as much to the full panel as is possible. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, 
did all of you had a knowledge about the train card game before voicing in Yu-Gi-Oh or not? None. Nope. I only saw the cartoon first before I knew there was a card game. Yeah, I had no idea. I still, I still don't. I was going to say, I still don't know how to play. Short. Uh, yeah, feel free to adjust the mic. <laughs> Mary, you're great as you are. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like to say, first of all, the Dark Side of the Dimensions, I was so excited when that came out and there was new content. Uh, I dragged my husband to go see it in the theaters, and I unfortunately at the time had a really bad case of the flu, but I was like, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to be the uh, first in the theaters. But my question is, what's everyone's favorite season and why? Ooh. Ready? Anyone? I still love the very first episode Mai appeared in, so the first season was my favorite. Um, yeah, and it was also new and exciting. So for me as an actor, that was, that was just my favorite. It was fun. I like the Egyptian story arc because it sort of put it all together and you know what their real relationship is. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm in line with that, um, and, but also I relate to what Megan was saying. That, that first season, it was new, it was fresh, it was magical. You've probably heard of like the honeymoon period of a relationship, kind of like that. But one thing that I really admire, uh, among other things about the whole series, is that it had a beginning and a middle and an end. So the conclusion of the interrelationship between Yugi and Yami was obviously fun to do as an actor, but very satisfying to witness as an audience. And we, you know, we are an audience to the work. I mean, you, you may not understand that we think of it that way too, right? But so, yeah. Oh, hello there. Um, hey. I know I talked about this to Eric at his booth, but um, the fourth season of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX never got dubbed, and for unknown reasons, like Eric told me, maybe they weren't selling enough cards or the ratings weren't good. And recently, um, since Konami bought the rights, I actually sent emails to Konami Cross Media and actually got a response. I said, would you guys ever consider finishing what you never finished before? And they said, we'd definitely consider that. And in the fourth season, you know, well, first Eric was the director of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX and um, there's in the very final episode, Jaden duels Yugi, who eventually becomes a Tem. And uh, would you definitely, and I don't know, probably ask some dumb question because they love you, Dan. Um, you definitely would be coming back as um, Yugi and would Eric definitely come back to direct that season? Well, before he says that, I only directed the first season of GX because they, uh, as a senior voice director, I would start shows and then move on. Chris Colet actually directed the rest of uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Yeah. And you know, if your question is, would I return to those roles anytime? All right, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Hello. To go into my question, like, what were bad experiences you have had at cons, if any? A bad convention experience? You know, I, I, can't, I can't really, I'm not just being diplomatic, I, I, I can't really think of one. Um, what, what, what I feel uh, worst about is when uh, I don't feel like I've given enough time to the person who's in front of me. And sometimes that happens because there's a long line or it's at the end of the day. I mean, when, not the most recent time we were in London, but five years before, I mean, we were, they had to shoo us out of the main hall, but we still had like 50 people that wanted stuff. And we were like signing stuff yeah. in, in, in like where the, in the storage area where the tables were all packed up. But, you know, because you understand that the autograph is, is really just a memento of the more important interaction, right? So, yeah. That doesn't really provide you with a juicy story. So. Yeah. Okay. One guy pulled a gun on me and I was like, no way, open your mind. Uh, no. Well, I, like, I've heard stories of like, some, like uh, Scott McNeil got licked by some girl. No, that time. was me. <laughs> but I was the long hair, that's why I thought it was a girl. You know? uh, we should probably move on to someone else. Thank you so much. Hello. So it, this is going to be a really difficult question, but if you had to pick one card that was used anywhere throughout the anime and say that one was your favorite, which one would you end up with? Blue Eyes White Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> How's this even a question? <laughs> no, seriously, though, that, that, that's a good shot. Uh, do you have 
I love all the Harpy Lady cards, but um, wait, I'm trying to picture them and figure out which one's my favorite. I think the Harpy Sisters. I just think the artwork is super gorgeous. Yeah, yeah across the board, the artwork is fantastic. So I suck at playing the game, and I look at it from the story perspective, so Dark Magician is the card that's most relevant to the characters I portray. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good question. Uh, hello. Hey. I just wanted to see what is your favorite... Ah, I forgot the question. Hold on. Uh, Chocolate. <laughs> no? no, no um... Spider-Man. <laughs> no. uh, okay, I got it. Uh, what's your favorite rare card that you might own? Oh, gosh. Ooh. I don't know. Uh, what would you consider rare? Uh, I do have the original Dark Magician Girl from when the... I'll go with that one. That... Yeah, that's my choice, too. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yeah, We're there we go. You nailed it. Page, you nailed it. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hi. Uh, so, at, in the past, at Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG Nationals, you guys would do like live duels. Yeah. Yes. Something like that. You guys remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, how was the experience with that? And um, what does it differ doing like a live reading versus like in a studio? I, I'll say it's just fun to work with him, like not dubbing and then go back and forth, but actually getting to perform on stage yeah. with him. Yeah. That's fun. I yeah, mean, I agree. It, it yeah. is. It's really fun to work with me. And uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. No, no but yeah, it's but it's the audience reaction. The first time we did a live duel, I was with Greg Abbey in Pittsburgh a long time ago, and it was almost like a live sporting event. We, we didn't know how the audience was going to react and like we you know pull up moves. You know, the, the, and there was a crowd kind of like as close to uh, you know us as, as you guys are and about about as large, and they'd just be like, "What? No!" And like <laughs> Greg and I were just like, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is crazy." So it's very exhilarating. Yeah. 2011 was my first Yu-Gi-Oh! National, so I saw that live and it was great. I'm glad I you liked it. Yeah, 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 they're yeah. a lot of fun to do. Yeah. They're a lot of fun to do. Oh, could you somebody help? You can feel free to move that down. <laughs> Jump for each word. Just <laughs> Jump, awesome. Jump. Jump. Oh, there you go. I don't have to go. <laughs> um, well, first I want to say thank you. You touched on this briefly uh, during the panel, but yeah, my friends are in the audience right over here. Uh, hey, I met them yeah. over a decade ago because I was wearing my Millennium uh, puzzle necklace. Awesome. So they're, they're still here with me today. Uh, they're putting up with me so far. Um, <laughs> but uh, also, someone kind of partially asked this question earlier. They asked you what your favorite season, your favorite arc was. Um, I would like to know specifically, do you have like a favorite moment or like a favorite line? Mm -hmm. I've got one that I, I, I yeah, anyway, the only reason I duel Yugi, aside from the island trips, the cars, the clothes, the prize money, is the thrill of trouncing a worthy opponent. Nice. Awesome. Maya is so awesome. <laughs> I don't have a specific, I really don't. I mean, as the director and working on the show all the time, it all was one big blur. Basically, it's anything Kaiba said. <laughs> That's oh, a very no, kind of answer. Yeah. Anything. On, on point. Um, <laughs> people will want, you know, come up and, and you have the opportunity to get a quote on, you know, signed. And so I'll answer it in, in terms of my favorite quote associated with my character is, is, is something that you can live by. So, like I'm a big Spider-Man fan, the, the, with great power comes great responsibility is a code you can live your life by. Um, and, you know, there's something cool about it's your move, or it's time to duel, or believe in the heart of the cards, but I, I think the one that, that resonates on a more universal level is believe in yourself, and you will always prevail. Yeah. Um, hi. Hey. Uh, I wanted to ask, because you all uh, have a pretty good connection with Joey, and he's my favorite character. Yes! So, uh, I wanted to ask what your favorite part of each of your characters' dynamic with Joey. <laughs> oh my gosh, I mean, my and Joey, that was so fun. That yeah. just, like... Talk um, about shipping. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the 
rom the I would say romantic tension, but it wasn't even that close. It was a <laughs> far off romantic tension. Um, that was just super fun, and and the fact that my learned from him and learned about friendship. How, I mean, how crazy cool is that? I think it's interesting that uh, Kaiba can't stand him, and. <laughs> And, and how Joey takes the bait all the time. But if you, really, if you really look at what that dynamic is, it's probably because Kaiba doesn't want anyone to be a closer friend to Yugi than he is. I think that's really why Joey annoys him. Yeah. Um, to, to have somebody in your life who is so devoted, I mean, they, they, you know, as you guys, you've read the manga, they didn't start off being friends, right? right. Actually, not too dissimilar from you and Chris Collet. Right. But, uh, but then they, they forged this loyalty that is unbreakable, and that is such an admirable thing. And, uh, you know, and I mean, Wayne Grayson is a total jerk, but uh, no, I'm kidding. He's one of my dearest friends. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have met my wife without him. Uh, but uh, so, but I, I think it's so admirable to see friendship portrayed in, in such a compelling way. And I know it might sound like a, you know, a little cliche, but the power of friendship, I would be nowhere without that. Yeah. Great question, though. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right, and since we are super over, let's do lightning round for our last three so we let's can start changing over for our next panel. Here let's we go. go. What's your favorite Millennium item? Millennium <laughs> Puzzle of Gold. I like the eye, because didn't they show that into Pegasus' eye? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm blanking. I like them all. <laughs> I like them all. <laughs> They're pretty. Uh, I just got curious when Dan said that Patrick Stewart was his inspiration for, uh, you know... Well, an element, an element. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, when you guys first got introduced to these characters, did you guys have the voice down on spot, or did you kind of have to work with it to get to where it is now? And if you were, could you maybe share what it could have sounded like? Uh, Kaiba was not a voice search. Kaiba was an attitude search. Uh, they wanted this this cool thing, so I, I I mean, I'm not doing that much beyond what I sound like. It's the attitude. So that was that was the discovery of that. So I didn't know how else to approach him. It was he didn't he didn't need whipped cream on what he was doing. He needed he needed the attitude. Not most of the time when we audition, that's it. It's more about attitude than a voice. I mean the. You know, it'll be young, maybe it's from a particular region, but generally you're hanging your hat on an attitude. But sometimes you have to change the way you naturally sound in order to be appropriate to the character. So I, I'm still surprised to this day when I meet people who didn't realize I did both Yugi and Yami. Yeah. And um, we all are old enough here in this audience. The running joke in the booth with you know, people asking, you know, how do I do that? Um, to get Yugi's voice so high, I would say I have removable testicles. Um, I only recently realized that all testicles are removable. It's putting them back. That's the, that's the trick. But it, that's all just technical breath support stuff. And it took a while to land on what was the right balance. Obviously, what they do in the Japanese, which I thoroughly respect, is very different than what I was asked to do. These weren't my choices. Uh, you, as an actor, you do what you're told or you're gone. Um, so. Yugi and Yami sound more similar in the first season. As the series goes on, they sound more different, more obvious with Yugi, where they just kept on wanting him to go a little bit lower and, and that sort of a thing. So it, it's a process. You'll find that true of many animated series or even live action series. The characters change a bit as they go, and that's not inconsistency. That's a growth in the performance. All right, thank you for answering. Yeah, I was one of those people who I was surprised that you did both. Uh, I was like, but you know, it's impressive, man. Thanks, what's your name? Uh, my name's Sam. Sam, always believe in the heart of the cards. Hell yeah, thanks. <laughs> you need to put this back now. And we have our final question coming up and then we will change over to our next panel in just a few Here short moments. Here we go, what do you got? I always like to see the battle, the duels, and that was my favorite part of the show. What's your favorite duel that you got to voice? Ooh, mm, when I threatened to jump off the building. <laughs> and he accuses me of cheating. <laughs> my, my favorite duel was the conclusion of the series. Oh. Yeah, yeah you do cheat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> So, so, no, I like here, this kid. Yeah, yeah, he's, 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 a great, he's a great kid, I like but here, here's the difference. 
I don't cheat. It's just that the writers are on my side. That's right. Yeah. There we go. We summoned a card. Well, again, I defer to the writers. You can play. Maybe the writers cheat. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, all right. <laughs> Megan, answer your question. All right. I liked dueling Joey and Yugi. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. Awesome. There you go. Well, thank you again, Megan Hollingshead, Eric Stewart, and Dan Green. Thank you very much. Okay. All righty.